and nutrition education. Join them, helping to alleviate hunger in our community. Thank you for what you do for our community. And speaking of food, there is plenty around here. Help yourself to all the vendors. You're thirsty, whether you're an adult or a kid. Sunday, right down there in Stockyard Station. Don't miss that. The growler. I thought that was something you drank out of. Let's give it up right now for Clayton. Fantastic. Experience. The experience is located right here in the Stockyards. Jesus Christ, who is the Creator God, came into this world to prepare a place in heaven for His disciples. He told us that in His Father's house there are many rooms. And Thomas, who's known as Doubting Thomas, did not know what he was talking about. Jesus told them, where I go, you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, the reason why Jesus Christ is the only way and the only means by which we can be reconciled to God is because God is holy and he demands perfection. And Jesus Christ fulfilled all of the requirements of the divine law. He was completely obedient and all the things that we have failed in, Jesus Christ, he prevailed in. We have lied, we have stolen, we have said God's name in vain, and yet Jesus Christ, he's the sinless Savior. We see, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So based on the glorious reality of the sinless Savior, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And so will you come and trust in the Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life? See, he is your only hope because he is the only one who is perfectly righteous. He is the spotless lamb. He is the perfect sacrificial lamb who went to the cross to die for sinners. When John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who is taking away the sins of the world. And so we need a spotless lamb. We need one who is without sin. Because apart from the sinless Savior, there can be no hope. You see, God is holy. He is the thrice holy God. And we are all going to stand before God one day. We have all we have all sinned against Him. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But today we're proclaiming a free gift of grace. That you can be justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, we all know God. There is no such thing as an atheist because the heavens declare the glory of God. God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And so my question for you today is, what sin is preventing you from coming to the Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life? What sin is preventing you from coming to the God that you know? Again, we all know God and we are all without an excuse. The Bible says we are unapologetous in the Koine Greek, which means you are without an apologetic for saying that you don't know God. We are all without a defense for claiming we don't know this creator. Jesus Christ, he has come. And he went to the cross after living that sinless life, after obeying all of the demands of the law that we had failed in. He was perfectly obedient to and he died. He was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. And he is the one who has inaugurated this glorious salvation. He is the one who has inaugurated a perfect peace, a perfect redemption. And so it's by the blood of the Lamb that you can be redeemed today. You see, it's not based on your works. It's not based on the good things that you do, but it's based on the merciful character of God. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith and this is not of you it's not something that you can do in and of yourself it is the gift of god not of works so that no one may boast and so my only boast is in the cross of christ the one who is the way the truth and the life you see apart from jesus there is no life the apostle john in his letter in the first uh, first epistle of john he says the one who has the son has life and the one who does not have the son does not have life you see, we are not presenting the Christian worldview as the best possible worldview or a worldview that's going to make your life better, but we're telling you that because Jesus is the source and foundation of all life and he gives all life to all creatures, you can't even have life apart from Jesus Christ. There is no life apart from him. And so this is good news for you that you can come and have everlasting life because he has prepared a place for his disciples, those who follow after him. Now, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Well, Jesus said that if anyone does not hate father, mother, brother, sister, and even their own life, 
they are not worthy of following me. But what he meant is, your love has to be more than, anyone who does not love me more than father, mother, brother, sister in life is not worthy of me. See, Jesus told people to count the cost, to consider what it is to follow after him. See, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That's what Jesus taught. So what does that mean? Well, if you love your reputation, if you love your identity, if you're clinging on to the things of this world, well, then you're going to eventually lose your life because you're loving that which is contrary to God and contrary to his law. If you're loving your sin, if you're loving that which God says is contrary to his ways, that which is not righteous, that which is not good, well, then you'll lose your life. But if you hate your sin, if you hate your identity in this world, then you will keep it. You will have everlasting life. The Bible says, do not love the world nor the things in the world because if anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. And so the call for you is not to love the things of this world, not to love the unethical standards of the world, but to love Jesus Christ, the one who has conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. See, he is the author of life, and we try to kill the author of life in our sin. But what happens when you try to kill the author of life? Well, he emerges victorious from the grave because the pangs of death could not hold him. And so we're here to proclaim to you that Jesus Christ has prepared a way for his disciples through this free gift of grace. Salvation is a free gift of God. You cannot earn salvation. It's all based on his grace. The very definition of what grace is, is it's no longer on the basis of works. It is unmerited favor. It's favor from God that we don't deserve. It's favor from God that we cannot earn. And this Christ is the true and living God who has come to die for ungodly sinners like you and me. And so the call for you today is to repent and believe, to come and have peace with God, to actually receive reconciliation for your sins, not to trust yourself, not to trust your reputation, not to trust the clique that you belong to, not to trust your identity or your job or your material wealth or any of those things, but to trust in Jesus Christ, the one who has died for the ungodly. Speaking of God the Father in the book of Colossians, it says, who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ's earthly ministry went about telling people, your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees said, this man is committing blasphemy. Who can forgive sins? And the reality is only God can forgive sins. And yet Jesus forgave people because Jesus is God. The Bible says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word that was God became flesh and dwelt among us just as the Old Testament prophets prophesied. The prophet Isaiah said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and to peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Meaning that God will accomplish the increase of his government. The scriptures tell us that the kingdom of God starts out like a small stone and it grows to be a mountain that fills the whole earth. And so what we see in this text is that Jesus Christ is the mighty God who is the Prince of Peace, who came to bring peace between God and man. Our sins have made a separation between us and our God so that he does not hear. But Jesus Christ is that glorious mediator who gave his life as a ransom for all who would follow him, for all who would call upon his name will be saved. And so in Colossians, we see that it is in Christ that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses and the forgiveness of our sins. It says that he is the image of the invisible um, God, the firstborn of all creation. See, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean he actually came into being. The word firstborn in the Greek is prototokos. It means that he is the rightful heir over all creation. That the creation is subordinate to Christ because he's the one who created it, and he is the one who rightfully rules over it. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. And when he rose from the grave victorious, after being pierced for transgressors like you and me, he rose up appeared over 500 witnesses and he ascended and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. And it is by this ruler of kings on earth that today you can be freed from your sins by his blood. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Because in him all things were created in the heavens and on the earth, 
the visible and the invisible, whether thrones, whether dominions, whether rulers, whether authorities, all things were created in him. Jesus Christ created all things and in him, uh, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. See, all things are held together by Jesus Christ. The universe is held together by the righteous God who has created us. And he is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, in order that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus Christ, he has first place in everything. To him belongs the glory. To him belongs all things. He is the creator God who is worthy to be praised. He is the only one that you should offer your allegiance to. Offer allegiance to King Jesus and have everlasting life as a gift today. This is the call for you. It says, because in him, all the fullness was pleased to dwell. The word theotetos is not here. Often we add the fact that uh, he was in the fullness, he was God. But in Colossians 2.9, it says, because in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Theotetos in the Greek. And so the reality is, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God dwelt bodily. This is the testimony of the scriptures that Jesus Christ is truly God. That his name is Emmanuel. If you read Matthew 1, it actually is uh, talking about the prophecy in Isaiah 7:14, where one would be born of a virgin, the Parthenos, and that his name would be Emmanuel. That word El is short of Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God. And El is also a Hebrew word for God. And so Jesus Christ, he is God with us. He is near to our hearts. He is near to us. And he is the one who lives to intercede on behalf of all who believe in him. To all who call upon his name, he gives them the power to become a child of God. You can become a child of God today if you would repent of your sins and turn away from your debauchery. Again, we all know this God. We all know he exists, but do you actually love him? Has your heart been changed? Has he caused you to be born again to a living hope? Bring your dirty hearts before the king. Bring your dirty hearts to Christ and be cleansed. There is a fountain that is filled with blood. You see, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. See, we are encompassed. We are ensnared in our death. We are ensnared in our sins. But rather than being ensnared in our sin, chasing after orgies and debauchery and drunkenness, I would exhort you to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Have redemption in this glorious Savior. It says, and through him to reconcile to him all things, making peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, whether the things on earth or whether the things in heaven. Jesus Christ has come to bring peace by the blood of the cross. You see, the Old Testament prophets promised that the Prince of Peace would come, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And we see in Ephesians 2 that he himself is our peace. Now, without Christ, there is no peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who makes peace between God and man. So rather than claiming that there's peace when there is no peace, come and have peace and be reconciled to God today. You see, the concept of reconciliation assumes the fact that we are not right with God. The Bible tells us that we go from being children of wrath like the rest of mankind, that we are enemies of God, but he is reconciling the world to himself through his blood. And then we see that God intervenes. God changes the course of our inner disposition. He changes the course of our sin. And it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are being saved. You see, that grace, it is a divine passive. We cannot save ourselves, but God grants grace to all who he desires to save. We go from being dead in our sins, not wanting God, hating his law, hating all of his ways, hating all of his standards, to living by the only righteous standard that actually makes sense out of reality. You see, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you reject the omniscient God who has created all things, you can't know anything for certain because you're merely a finite man. I'm merely a finite man, so I need the infinite God to actually justify my knowledge. And that's why the Bible tells us that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this is why the atheist who rejects the objective standard of truth, we started out by saying Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. If you reject Christ as the truth, you don't even have the truth. You have no truth, and then the claim from the atheist is that there is no objective truth claims, that we can't know anything for certain, and yet the Christian is wrong. You see, see, this is the folly of unbelief, that they want to say that we can't know anything is right or wrong, but the Christian is wrong. 
See, that is what unbelief is. And that's why the Bible says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord knows that you know him. You might not know him intimately. You might not know him salvifically. But intellectually, you know him. Even the demons believe in the shudder. See, atheism is a strange vice that neither the demons fell for. The demons never fell for that. The demons know God. They know he exists. But they reject him and they've fallen away. And so take your suppression of truth and stop it. Stop suppressing the truth of God and unrighteousness and receive the Christ who died for the ungodly. Have redemption. Have redemption for your souls. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And so bring your miserable souls to Jesus Christ and he will cleanse you of all of your sin and all of your unrighteousness. See, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you claim to be a good person, you don't even have the truth in you. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. So today, be cleansed of your unrighteousness. Stop living a lifestyle suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness, but come and trust in the righteous one who laid down his life for sinners, who laid down his life for the unrighteous. Thus says the Lord, he says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Christ the King was pierced for sinners like you and me, and now salvation is being poured out to the ends of the earth. When Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished, to telestai. It's a perfect tense verb in the Greek, which means this took place in the past, but it continues to have effects in the present. Jesus Christ secured an eternal redemption for all of his sheep. And he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. He said, I am the good shepherd. Micah 5.2 prophesied that the shepherd was going to come and that he would be born from Bethlehem and his coming forth would be from of old of ancient days. That this is the ancient God who would come and be this good shepherd. And Christ, when he came in his earthly ministry, he said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life on behalf of the sheep. So come and follow the good shepherd who is kind and merciful and gracious. And he is able to save to the uttermost.